Welcome back everyone to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill and I'm delighted again to be able to speak to Richard Stavely and Lawrence Schulz of Gresham House Strategic, two of the most accomplished and activist investors in the UK. So uh, welcome, gents. Morning, Paul. Good to um, see you. Now, we, uh, given the excellent vaccine news over the last sort of three weeks, uh, what is your broad outlook for small caps and um, equity markets in general for 2021? Uh, well, Paul, I think I think this is is clearly positive news um, from a position of sort of, you know, clearly sort of very negative outlook from from many, many people. I think it's the, the markets reacted accordingly. And, you know, November is going to shaping up probably to be one of the biggest months ever in equity equity markets. I think um, as a result, it's easy to and I think probably right to say that right now we may have a small period of, of sort of consolidation, pause for breath, possibly even some profit taking for by, by some people. But relatively quickly, we will remove into what this vaccine news, news means. And, you know, um, Pfizer obviously kicked it off. Um, you know, they've got great credentials for um, lifting up the nation, having kind of uh, developed Viagra for, for, the, for the <laughs> <laughs> so, so I can't I can't see why they can't do, do more with this. But there's going to be more vaccine news over the next over the next um, few, um, weeks out weeks and months from the other candidates as, as as well. And what that means is we can get back to reality. And what's separate here is it in the in terms of what's different this time is most economic recoveries actually take a bit of time, take a bit mm -hmm. of time to get going, and they're quite gradual. But actually, although the first half of next year will clearly be disruptive and we'll have some Brexit, Brexit news and people keen to put negative Brexit news in certain media outlets. But the reality is, is that um, the second half of 21 and markets thinking forward, you know, is coming into the lens of most investors, you know, you know right, right now and rapidly. And that's very positive. And once, I, we, have, once we have mass immunisation, let's say second half of next year, We've got certain trends that are tr have been transformational and certain ones which are sort of like, um, you know, will go back to, will mean revert and go back to normal. But I mean, ESG is obviously, you know, right in the sort of crosshairs of investors going forward. How do you see sort of like the, the opening up trade? Because there'll be certain sectors which you don't really want to stay, because well, well, they've been broken and they've been broken badly, like online, like um, physical retail. But there's others, maybe environmental, that you really want to play in. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair point. There are definitely, particularly the despite uh, despite the announcements by companies like BP and Shell, the you know the fossil fuel dispute exposed and energy sectors are going to find it challenging um, go, going forward as a result of investor focus on this area. I mean, from a GHS perspective, the G in ESG, we would put ourselves right at the top of those mm. that are concerned about governance. We spend more time with boards, working with boards, working on corporate governance and what's going to drive shareholder value than almost any other investor, we, we think. I, I think in terms of playing that environmental uh, trend or demand or indeed uh, opening up of, you know, actual um, uh, opportunity to grow business profits from it. We, we have selected within our very narrow portfolio of literally only 13, 13 equity positions, uh, a number of businesses that, um, that benefit from, from environmental trends. And we can maybe talk about those, those yeah. in a minute. Um, so I think that will I think that will be uh, an important uh, factor going going forward. There are areas which have got um, possibly a bit overexcited in certain stocks, but we think we found some ones which have been either left behind or people don't even realise their environmental plays and um, should benefit from that. Well, um, well, just just on that, I mean, one this morning which reported unbelievably good transaction and had the had the hallmarks of Gresham House all over it, should we say, was this unbundling play for ULS technology. Now, I've, I'm an experienced investor, or at least a, I, I try and convince myself I am. And I had a really good look at this. And I never saw this potential opportunity of unbundling the sort of like the, the vertical integration of the e, the the. The, its own its own sort of like selling e-conveyancing and its actual software and and this thing it, it just sold this 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 front end part of the business for 27 million pounds can you just talk yeah. us through i mean it looks an unbelievably good deal 
Yeah, I mean, we we actually started buying shares in this um, a week before the election last year uh, at, at less than £27 million was the market cap then. So we're pretty delighted that this value is sort of being, you know, recognised by the, by the company in through this transaction now. I mean, US technology is a classic stock which features into this why, um, you know, small cap is more, you know, is a greater source of returns than large cap. You've got a, re- a huge number of like overvalued technology companies listed on the market now. We're, as a still, we're still talking after the bounce, less than 50 million market cap, aren't we? And it's yeah, yeah, software it's, business. Yeah, it's about 40, it's about 40, uh, 40 million market cap now. And basically the, the company still has, um, it'll have loads of cash to invest into essentially its next generation product, which is called Digital Move. And they have a very strong position already. So eConvencer they have has a great network. It's in fact it's a platform, and you know we we know what investors think about of platforms. But ULS hasn't been uh, valued like that for 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 some some time now. And it's where they bring together panels of solicitors um, with uh, the sort of curators of uh, mor- mor- uh, mortgages. So everything from estate agents to uh, mortgage brokers and you know larger banks. In fact, the largest client which they renewed with this year is Lloyds Bank. Yeah. And actually, that renewal of Lloyds Bank is really critical because it basically implies uh, to us anyway and through our conversations that they are comfortable with the direction of travel of the company, which mm-hmm. is taking on digital proof. Now, what does digital move do? It massively speeds up the uh, length that t- length of time it takes to do a conveyancing. Um, um, transaction, a, a conveyancing transaction, um, but it also and this ability to do this digitally not only speeds it up, but what um, EULS uh, have a vision for now, and this will be explained and it hasn't been fully explained to us. It's fair to say at this point, the new CEO who looks very very high quality will be joining in uh, mm-hmm. early uh, next of next year. Very high credentials. And you know, we, we see a vision of this coming being more than just what it does now. So it can pull in lots of other kind of revenue streams into it into its platform. The underlying business that eConvencer has generates about five million of EBITDA. Yeah. So um, and the, of which they are then reinvesting some now into digital move. But that won't be a permanent permanent level of investment because they can uh, if Sort of in the heavy investment stage, stage, stage right, right now. So if you put if you put the kind of value they've just got for Cal, which is what they sold today, um, on the valuation uh, for e-conveyancer, then there's significant further upside. Oh yeah, no, I mean I just I did it this morning actually. I couldn't see any broker notes, and I mean I got at 71p. You get a market cap of 46 million. You then deduct your cash of 25 million. You get 21 million of EV. It does. If you take out the the sales that Cal does, you get eighteen million of, of revenues, roughly, and that puts it on a revenue multiple of one point two for, for exactly, effectively yeah. a dominant play in this market. And yeah. I mean, the reason why I, I I'm, I'm you know I just tip my hat to you guys because uh, you know I still think this. If I was going to suggest that investors have a good look at this as a software play, I, you know, I'm quite excited about it, and uh, it's certainly something people should have a look at because. I could see in the broader context, given the direction of travel, the likes of Right Move, Zoopla, who want to have told publicly they want to move into this space. Hey, it looks like a perfect fit to me. Why not do everything? Well, yeah, I mean, this whole area, people have different names for it. But it's sort of prop fintech type space is actually there's not there's not low, a lot of the activity that's going on is actually in the private space and private equity. And, you know, we could see there being, you know, New businesses coming out of private equity on the listed markets, and ULS is definitely positioned extremely well to be involved in a range of type of deals uh, yeah. going forward. Well, let's let, let's have, let's move on to some other stocks that you've got in your portfolio, and and two which you've just bought over the last sort of three months, you know, since we last spoke, which is absolutely fascinating. Are in this sort of like the media play, online media play with sort of like um, virtual real estate. And they look like huge, you know, contrarian plays. And it's Bonham Hill is one. And Bonham Hill, yeah. Bon- bon Hill, sorry. Yeah, Bonham Hill. Uh, and another one is, is Centaur Media. Can you just take us through the investment thesis on that one? Or both of them? Yeah. So Okay, sure, sure. Bonham Hill. Actually, Bonham Hill, if, if your listeners take one stock away from today, um, despite how excited they might get on some of our other ones, the, the one I want them to remember would be uh, or to, is Bonham bon Hill. And the reason why is because, very few people would have spoken or talked about that this stock. 
Why? Because it's really in the, it's, it's actually almost in the nano, nano market caps. It's like six, six million, million, six million, six million, million this morning. Cap. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So as you can imagine, not many small cap and uh, small cap mainstream funds. So, you know, they're not looking at this. It's, it's, they can't even get a position. They couldn't even get any sort of position in that. We've, we got, a, got involved through helping rescue the company during COVID by basically anchoring a rescue at 5p a share. Um, which has allowed them to get through, get through. So the business's net cash, kind of as we as we speak now, I, you know, on our numbers, it, we, we're not we're not fully up to speed. They haven't announced uh, recently. It's got twenty two million of revenue. This this business. Well, this is the thing. Yeah. So it's got it's got huge. It's actually um, so the history here is really interesting. Simon Stillwell, who was one of the um, early uh, sort of team that built Liberum Capital, the stockbrokers up, and also used to work with Terry Smith, the Colin Stewart. He came into this company. It used to be an old ruined shell called Vitesse Media. Media oh, that's right. Ago. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So he came in and he basically raised money from some excellent investors, um, including um, one of your other speakers recently, uh, Schroeder's. Um, oh, yeah, Andy Brock. Uh, yeah. And they've got Katie Potts from the Herald Investment oh, Trust. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Investor and a range of other people. And actually, um, I note um, that uh, Anthony Cross, the manager of Lion Trust, Specialist actually has a huge position PA in, in this stock, which is quite interesting. It's probably far too small for his, for his funds. Um, so what, what Simon's done is he's basically spent across two main big transactions about £28 million on, okay. top, of, on top of what he inherited in the Vitesse Media shell. So that's, that's more than four times its current market yeah, cap. That is now, and that's now valued at six, six million quid. Yeah. Why? Because they have quite a few events yeah. And events have obviously been off off this year, so they've had to work really hard to um, to cut costs and reposition for the dig- digital world. But they're doing that really, really well. He's also, but secondly, it's all, it's one of those ones where COVID sort of hit, and they only did the last acquisition during kind of last year. So they had they were driving out synergies into this year's P and L, which have then all been mixed up, and you can't really see them. So mm. when it comes out, it's going to come out. Really, really, uh, really. What, what will it look like if it, let's just assume it in 2022, once we've yeah. had mass immunization, let's say some of the events start coming back physical mm. and also virtual, and it's got yeah. its actual internet real estate, which is, is it B2B? I've got it down as B2B media for sort of like, uh, I yeah, so they, what they own, their main just quick, yeah, so. Financials first, and then what they've got second. So the company are targeting a fifteen percent operating margin, which EBIT, would be EBIT or EBITDA. EBIT, EBIT. <laughs> On twenty-two million. Yeah, okay. okay, so that should be that's that's in line with that's in line with this, that's actually lower than most of the sales. Okay, so that's three million of operating profit. There are the yeah, targeting. Okay, yeah, and then the sales could probably reboot to twenty-six, twenty-seven million at least um, at that point. Um, they own what, well, and what's interesting is again, uh, guess what? Uh, one of their events that they've launched that's been doing really well. Uh, it's called ESG Clarity. Yeah, uh, okay. lots of people wanting to attend that. They they also have a very interesting position in diversity. Okay. Um, so they have a number of diversity events. One of them is called Women in IT, yeah. which I think is fan- a fascinating idea, and I'm sure is you know highly popular. Um, and then they own in our industry, they own things like Investment News which is big, uh, particularly in the States. Um, that's the funny thing about this. Bond Hill is a mini UK small cap. But last year, it had more sales in the United States than it did in, in the right. UK. It's an international business. Uh, they also own Portfolio Advisor, um, which is a strong product. Again, a number of... Uh, so they're um, niche, niche online brands with strong following, selling yes. to people who actually want this content they can't get anywhere else. That's right. Um, so we think it's pretty similar. Now, I'd urge... Um, don't want to get too much into the weeds here but i would urge anyone that is interested in this to look at the latest rns on the grant of options for the bond hill management team so um we um were consulted and got involved in that and um we've set the bar at the level that we think this business is worth and the management are excited about about that so if you i'll, I'll leave you with that as some oh, okay people. right so it's a high bar is it <laughs> It's a high bar, um, which we think will they'll we think they will reach and will deserve um, decent money. Because I, I mean, the, the shares are still. I mean, I ran it last night. The shares are still eighty-four percent down year to date. I mean, eighty-four percent. 
but but Paul, you know, this is classic stuff, isn't it? You know, the large yeah. is the large stuff moves first. If you look at what Inform has yeah, done, yeah, yeah. Euro money and whatever, and then gradually people start sort of looking for for smaller things. So we do think this is um, you know well run. I, I've recently had meetings with every single divisional head uh, at Bon Hill. I can assure you. So you've kicked the tires. I'm sure you. I don't think any other investors done that. They're no. very high. They're actually very high quality people. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, um, and, and now they've got an incentive. They've got the carrot in front of them to really sort yeah, of like. Yeah. The L tip goes out. We've broadened the L tip out, not just to the very senior management, to the yeah. whole of management team. So. And I guess, I guess, Centaur Media is a similar sort of thing, but sort of slightly bigger. It's a 43 million market cap company with quite a bit of cash actually on the balance sheet. Um, but it's a sort of game B two B sort of specialist brands marketing week and fashion and stuff like that niche brands. Yeah, but very similar, very similar thesis. Um, it, a bit bigger company. Um, so roughly now forty two million of, of market cap, nine million of net cash. They yeah, yeah. they they reported reported uh, relatively recently. And sales. Um, I had 32 you know, for uh, 32, 32 million. The company has a, had a stated pre-COVID because um, it was in a sort of turnaround phase uh, of 20 percent. 20 percent. Oh, okay. EBITDA right. margins. 20 percent EBITDA margins. Yeah. Okay. Um, We're looking at six the, million EBITDA. Yeah. Yeah. Five to six. Yeah. At least. At least. And the, I think what's really interesting about this company at this point. Um, is that it used to be an old magazine company, uh, old traditional, and they're a bit slow at sorting themselves out. And then they've, it's really the tempo on that has really, really accelerated. So they had sort of six, seven, eight divisions literally three years ago, and now they're just down to two. Now, the, the, there's one which is, I think is a real gem, which, is, uh, which, is, which owns the lawyer. And now yeah, the lawyer yeah. is taken by every own, speak to a lawyer, and your li listeners are lawyers, they'll know, they'll take the lawyer. And they've converted the lawyer very successfully into being a subscription model um, and, and dig digital. Now it still has events and it still has recruitment and that's why it's been depressed this year. But we think the lawyer is worth at least 30 million pounds, at least alone, that, mm -hmm. divi that division. Uh, it's very profitable. It actually has a drop through profit rate of 60%. Um, right. Okay. So this is yeah. basically what we're talking about is a trophy asset here. Something we think it's a trophy desirable. asset. We think it's a highly. There is an American lawyer. Um, they have all the magic. And uh, I think a good, a good, actually a good, and for most companies, a good way of saying is your brand any good is ask you know if it's a subscription. So we how did the subscriptions go during this year when people were looking at cutting every cost mm. they possibly could? They've had over a hundred percent subscription New York, levels. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. they've actually they basically raised prices for some you know for some people as well so it's it's um it's a strong brand we think now the other division is a marketing uh, is a marketing division with a collection of um some really exciting businesses in there they have one business for instance which is all about introducing people to influencers around the yeah. world um to exp to expand their brands which is very highly thought of called oyster uh, oyster catches but they also um they also we're quite excited about a particular product they developed called mini mba which is a um, twelve-week mini MBA course on, uh, done online uh, by a, a very, very well-known uh, professor that they've worked with for a number of years, who has a take on the product, and it's gone absolutely nuts uh, in wow. the last two years, like very fast. They'll be updating the market on that early in the new year. We expect that has been really accelerated as people look to improve their CVs, um, you know, develop, you know, in continue their training. That's been that product's been adopted by. Um, by um, like blue chip companies to, for their in internal training as well. So it's okay. Well, I mean, I, I, these are contrarian plays. I mean, but they're deep, deep value. So I, you know, I'm with you. Immunisation programs. It looks like there's a lot of upside in uh, in both. Well, I don't want to get too macro, Paul. But like the, the truth is, a lot of people are talking about value versus growth. We talked to you about it last time. You know, I think you know, I think we can cl clearly say the bottom's probably been seen. But it had got so extreme between value and growth. There's been a move in from very extreme to now wide. But in as much as literally in. To, you know, from in 2007, people forget interest rates were 5.75%. Mm. Yeah. And then over the next two years, they were cut to 0.5%. Yeah. And, and then over 10 years, people worked out the, glo the growth stocks could be revalued on the basis of that. We, we, you know, we are potentially at the start of a broadening out of, of 
um, what investors are focusing on. And so we do think our more value uh, biased portfolio um, is going to get re, you know more looked at, more re-rated over the over the hey, years. I, I've years had a good ago. look at your portfolio, and I'm agreed. I, you know, I think this 2020, 21, 2021 could be a banner year for you guys, given where you are. Um, but just on, on one, on one, I know on one, Lawrence. I know you talked about it last time. Pressure Technologies. It seems though, game two divisions, you've got the crest chip, not the crest chip, you've got basically the, um, the cylinder business, and then you've got this, uh, the oil and gas sort of, to- not tools, but sort of machine parts and stuff like that. One of them's doing really, really well, sort of like defense on the cylinder side and, and hydrogen. And then the other one is sort of like obviously waiting for the oil trade to come back. Can you just talk us through your pressure tech stuff? Correct. It's been a sort of t- tell of two halves at, at PT, really, with, with near-term pressures in the oil and gas division, which we do think now are, are bottoming out post the vaccine announcement. There's visibility on that demand for EMP and where parts at wells coming back online. And then you've got the cylinders, the cylinders division, which we always identified as a bit of an asset to cover. And through the crisis, like any good business, it's really proved that. So, you know, the historic element of the business was defence work for the nuclear subs. And these are kind of 40 foot long pressure tanks that go in the nuclear subs for ballast. So really high safety spec, really high pressure gas in the hazardous environments. Now, what new management team under Chris, the, the CEO, Sorry Gardner, the chair, we sort of advocated and it's known to us for, for the company. What, the, what they're doing a really good job of is extrapolating that technology and specialist skill set. You know, only a few handful of businesses in the world can do these massive tanks mm. safely. They're extrapolating that first into nuclear. They want two decent contracts with EDF in the past 12 months. But Can you talk a bit closer to your microphone? So, sorry, they, they want right. two really good contracts with EDF in the past 18 months, one tick. But the really exciting part is post-COVID, the emergence of the hydrogen opportunity, which we'd always ascribe some value me too, but COVID has certainly accelerated that and made it much larger of an opportunity. Now, yeah, they've referenced before in, in previous announcements, discussions with people like ITM Power, who some of your followers will know. They recently signed an exclusivity agreement with Shell Europe. Um, and, and what this is all about is the picks and shovels and the infrastructure for hydrogen as a fuel for heavy, heavy load transport. So, you know, you've got to store this hydrogen somewhere safely and in size. And the tanks they make for the subs are perfect for storing the hydrogen. And we're, we're really excited about the opportunity that the company's now sitting is there on. An, is there an unbundling play here in terms of you've got the brilliant c- cylinder business that is, has got huge, it's got great contracts at the moment. I mean, it, you know, it, it wins the sort of the, the submarine contract. So it's mission critical stuff, high margin, takes real intricate and precision engineering to build. And you've obviously got the hydrogen on top, which frankly is a matter of just wait and it's going to happen. It's just as a matter of how long it's going to take, but it's generating so much money. And then you've got the sort of the oil and gas business that will, will do well when the oil, oil price recovers and it's already starting to net for next year. So is there, an, is there an unbundling play here potentially? I, I, think, that, yeah, I think that potentially is... Paul, I, I think and I'm sure that the, the board and the management team and, and shareholders are thinking carefully about, you know, PMC, um, you know, and its strategic role with it within within the group. So um, w- what I would say is, um, you know, add to Laurie's very clear explanation is, is that genuinely, I think this is the most undervalued hydrogen stock on the London market by <laughs> some margin. Yes. Just to just put this in context, ITM Power yeah, is valued at £2 billion pounds yeah. market cap. It's projected to have sales next year of £30 million pounds and seven for this year. Mm. Yeah. Pressure Tech has got world-leading proven manufacturing capabilities that are good enough for our nuclear submarines. Yeah. yeah. And is going to potentially, uh, and it's and it got sales in that division alone of probably about eighteen million in the next yeah. in the next twelve in the next. And, and that's against and valued the market. eleven million quid. Yeah, it's no, about eleven million pounds. Yeah. yeah. So so we you know we think that the, um, the hydrogen opportunity is just completely not reflected in this in this stock. Yeah. No, I, I would agree. And another one which has sort of got looks as have the hallmarks of unbundling as well is uh, is Northbridge Industrial because again it's got an unbelievably good renewable strike data center load bank business called Crestchick that's world renowned and uh, and actually doing pretty well it's got record order book for manufacturing and then it's dovetailed with a, a sort of gas business a sort of like a gas tools Tasman out in in Australia 
and it, it, it's trading on about sort of 21 million market cap and doing 33 million of sales. And actually, he's had come through the COVID pretty well. But is 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 anyway? I mean, it, it, how, what are your thoughts on Northbridge going forward? Laurie, do you want to do you want to touch on that? Yeah, look, Paul, I think you've rightly identified uh, a potential thesis there. I mean, you've got two very different divisions. One is, has gone back to, unfortunately, being loss-making and probably warrants a slightly lower rating, which is the Tasman division, drilling. Not so much interest in that now. And then Crestchick, yeah, exposed to some really exciting markets, high-quality revenues from rental of these load banks to things like data centers, construction sites, um, and, and a good visibility on that and, and a really solid business. Now, together sort of they both get tarred with the same brush and and you're right to identify there is potential there to how do you break out the two so that they're both valued correctly and, and Crestic is the much larger of the two at the moment and not really represented in the, in the current market cap and you know that, that's why we recently you'll see a TR1 on Northbridge we've actually increased our stake to 15 percent in that equity now to reflect that sort of upside potential. I saw I mean, you, this... bought, you, you bought out Giles Hargreave, didn't you, or something like that? You nipped in some of his shares. He said, thank you very much. I'll have that. I think he reduced a little bit. He's still a yeah, bit, that's still right, big yeah. shareholder. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, I, I, w- I would say, you know, just on our broader conversation, ESG and recovery, and once we get through this, the, you know, we get the mass immunizations, pr- pr- um, pressure tech and Northbridge look like perfect opportunities to, uh, to, to, to benefit from those, um, no doubt about it. And now moving on to another one you've recently bought into that I know you may not be able to talk about great, a great deal because it's early days, but is Infrastrata. Again, something I always thought the UK's defence business was dead. As in not, it's not defence, it's the shipbuilding business. But you've obviously seen a yeah. fantastic opportunity for them to uh, snap up Harlan and Wolf. Yeah, so infrastructure is a relative, it's a quite a small investment for us. It's one of our smallest of the last of the of the thirteen, and it's I would also describe it as relatively early days in sort of developing our thesis and potentially our stake, you know, our stake in in that in that business. It's got two parts to it. Um, I mean, one is to do with its history. It used to be a sort of slightly failing kind of gas project in, I- in Ireland, which was sort of over-promoted and never really got anywhere and took ages to go. And the current management team who came in now about two, year- two years ago, came in initially to sort of sort, to sort out that-, that project. It's called Island McGee. Yeah. And it's, and- um, Northern Ireland, isn't it? Yeah, Northern Ireland. And what it is, is it's, it's, um, it's a gas- caverns. Sto- yeah, oh, salt cannons, gas storage, yeah, exactly. And we used to, the, the country, UK, used to have uh, strategic storage for gas, which is what the Germans have, the French, the, you know, everyone else in Europe. So when, you know, you've got some storage of gas, if the, the Russians turn off the gas in, yeah. in Germany, Germany's case. Centrica and, closed that, didn't it? It used to have a yeah, big... Yeah, Centrica sort of, closed, it's called the rough facility. That's it, it's, yeah. It, it was closed. And now we're actually, if you compare us against other countries, we've actually got, you know, probably not enough and definitely less than everyone else. So we think that makes it quite strategically valuable. Now, the key is with these things is you have to have them near, um, you know, on the coast, near the, you know, near infrastructure. And it, and it, and it is in those, the, the salt that they've identified in this project is in exactly the perfect position um, in, 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 in Northern Ireland. Now, the, the, interestingly, the CEO brought in as the new finance director, um, Arun, who formerly worked um, uh, for um, at Vittel. Uh, and then subsequent to him joining, they have managed to uh, sign a, an, a, a gas offtake agreement for that project, which basically makes it kind of potentially bankable because you mm. could, someone will take the offtake. Now, the numbers are, are pretty ludicrous. In fact, their latest presentation does have all this information in, but the NPV of this project is worth like well over a hundred million. Right. And what, what? Now, they own a hundred percent of it. Yeah. Okay. However, like with all big projects, it costs a huge amount to develop. We think the reconstruction costs could be 300, 350 million, million sterling. So at a really strategic point where they're basically looking to uh, get the final marine license, just one license left, yeah. final marine license. And then at that point, then you want to bring external investors. Now, this gets back to it in, uh, in terms of ESG. Yes. Because actually, these salt caverns may be 
potentially used for even hydrogen mm. storage, not just natural mm. gas storage. But there are infrastructure investors, there are pension funds looking for um, sort of cash flows. So the cash flows of this of this of this the sort of business model of this facility are very very significant. You know, we're talking you know 60 million sales a year and EBITDA of um, I think it's 24 million a year once it's up to maturity. So what they will do is rather like an old fashioned oil and gas company. The idea would be they'll give up. X percent, probably, I don't know, 75, 80 percent, it's unclear what the terms they'll get of the project. And they'll give that away for a farm in. And for that person who's farming in will then sort of commit to the capital, the, the, the capital cost to develop the rest, thus leaving, hopefully, infrastructure with no further cost to put in, a stake in something rather valuable, and then they could choose to monetize that state, state later. Unless someone wants to come into all of more, it. More broadly, for these long sort of like duration projects, stuff that where you only yeah. get your return in year four, yeah. five, or you know even later yeah. in terms of hydrogen, etc. Hey, if another technology is invented in inter- in in intermediary, you know, I don't know whether cold fusion or something like that. Yeah. How do you price that into your sort of investment thesis at the start? Yeah. That's the hardest part. It isn't near term. It isn't even medium term. It's more long term generating. It's absolutely, it's, it's absolutely critical, Paul. And that's why what you want to do is like what we think we've done is you want to buy it when you're not paying anything for it at all. <laughs> so the thesis for why we've bought an infrastructure has nothing to do with what we've been talking about. It's about if nothing, sh- if nothing else, Richard. You're a very honest man. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we think we think there potentially could be a lot of value come out of Island McGee, but you don't need to pay up for it at the moment. Yeah. At the current share price, it's it's in for very, very, very little. Yeah. They they've actually they probably on any deal, they'd probably get paid back the costs they put into it, which are about 15 million to date. Yeah. The reason yeah. why we bought um Infrastrata shares is because they've actually very entrepreneurially, and once they got the uh, you know the bit between the teeth with that project, which was really all over the place. Mm-hmm. They basically bought Harlan and Wolf. Yeah. Um, in in Belfast, iconic. This is a shipbuilding company. Yeah. I thought yeah. I thought shipbuilding was done out in China and South Korea. It's yeah. a very it's a very good point, but you, I'm sure you've been watching um, the Prime Minister. Yeah, uh, Boris. Late, Boris of late, uh, waxing lyrical about the resurgence of yeah. ship, uh, British shipbuilding. Now we've always seen him wax lyrical about all kinds of things, and nothing and nothing happens. So, however, we do think he's pretty serious about about this. Um, he actually name-checked in his press conference about yeah. it, uh, both Apple Door, which is the secondary purchase they've made, which down is the main line yard. You're down in Devon. And, and then, and also Holland and Wolf in, in Belfast. And, you know, we're going into, you know, the dreaded B word of, on January the 1. January, uh, I can't think of a better way of helping the Northern Irish economy be part of, uh, you know, part of the United Kingdom and then supporting the development of, of the uh, Holland and Wolf uh, shipyard. Hey, I'll, I'll be ha- and what would be helpful for that would obviously be a couple of uh, contracts from the MOD. Yeah. Fortunately, they just signed off a massive new uh, uh, budget for that. And Holland and Wolf doesn't need huge amounts um, to, to get. We think break even is about 20 million of sales for this yeah. business. It used to do considerably more. Um, and it wouldn't take more than a couple. For contracts for it to move from break even to being profitable. Now, the, the management team have, have have stated that they think at about eighty percent capacity, the business could be doing three hundred to four hundred million of sales yeah, uh, yeah. out of Holland and Wolf. So this is a more like something that could develop over the next ten, literally mm. ten years. And I know lots of investors seem to have a very short time span, but we're looking for things that can, you know, have a have an investment thesis beyond, you know, the three to five, so that um, the other investors will take it on from us or other people will. Find Find it exciting after that and i think just final piece on this the management team they are they this dot went into administration beforehand because the previous owners were fred olson the yeah. uh, scandinavian oh, okay. oil, and they were only focused on oil and gas and the the business plan that the guys have got is to go into other verticals so um so for, uh, believe cruise it or not the cruise like- the cruise line industry is uh, as well yeah. um so well, I mean, exactly. I, you know, you look at it big picture and Boris said that he needs to upgrade the whole Navy and there's a whole lot of Type 25 frigates or whatever they call them, type something, coming down the pipe. So uh, it, I think it, they, if, they, if they're going to give them to German manufacturers, that isn't going to go well in, in Westminster, is it? And there's only one or two places you can build these things. Well, I think that's the main point. This is the main point. The thing is, is that the it means that the existing players who've got a bit of a monopoly on it, frankly, yeah. the government have worked that out, are going to be full 
So they need more capacity. They actually need more capacity. And what's interesting about Harlan and Wolf is it's it's one of the largest dry docks in the world, let alone uh, you know, mm -hmm. and definitely in the UK. Which means it's big enough. For instance, we could the the carriers could potentially dock there with not much additional capex required to make them capable. But they you know, so you get the spill out work could be sufficient to create a business case and get and get it get it. Yeah, going. hey, but, I live in I live in Birmingham, and I remember the eighties, and everybody wrote the car industry off. And hey, we then got Nissan, we got Toyota, we got um, Jaguar Land Rover, and we became the best or one of the the, big, the second biggest car manufacturer in Europe. So there's no reason why the ship, British shipbuilding industry can't uh, sort of reciprocate. Now, just moving on to another really sort of fascinating inter, um, purchase you did this uh, this last three months, Ted Baker. Now, I always thought Ted Baker was a second tier brand, but you've, you've sort of like picked up quite a nice sort of position in, in, in the retailer. And given the backdrop of its competitors all falling like 10, you know, nine pins, is this a, is this a sort of like a resurgence play? Is it, is it again sort of like... There's, there's two or three things that have happened here. I, I think the first with our portfolio going into COVID had basically nothing in consumer. So yeah, yeah. fortunately... So, so we were very cautious on consumer exposed businesses. Um, obviously, COVID opens up a kind of massive disruption and problems for COVID. And so we were looking at, can we, you know, is there something we can do during the depths of despair, which, which turns out to be a decent, you know, in, investment. Um, Ted's, just to be, you know, to remind everyone, was valued last year at 1.3 billion market cap. Yeah, it's about hundred. It's about two hundred and sixty this morning. Yeah, two hundred and sixty this morning. We got involved though at the our first investment was in the uh, rescue at seventy six p. So we bought those at seventy six p. They're currently trading at one thirty one thirty nine. Yeah, and our our target price would be well over two two quid. So you've only um, made a hundred percent on it, near enough. So quite far, a poor yeah, return, yeah. is it, in three months? <laughs> yeah, so far, it's quite volatile, though. I have okay. to say. It's quite volatile. The, yeah, they've got, they've got results coming up, actually, and I'd be quite cautious about you know, what yeah. those results might be. It's, really tr it's a really tricky year for them. Um, but the, 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 the interesting thing here is, is that the, the shares have gotten themselves into a, lot, into a bit of a pickle running into COVID anyway, as a result of the, the founder, Ray Kelvin, had been um, caught up in the kind of Huggate scandal mm. and basically had to leave, um, you know, leave, leave the board in his position. And, and what happened is the fo following that, it, 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 um, it exposed the, um, the, the senior management team had actually been a bit slow in adapting aspects of the business in recent years um, versus, versus competitors. And the brand still very, the brand is still sound. Uh, you know, talk, I know the way you well, I've worked at the way you love to value stocks. So in the last couple of years, they've been doing between 18 and 20 million of turnover at a hundred percent margin, just in brand revenues. So where you give like the, franchises, the eyewear yeah, okay. or the, the fragrance. So people have been paying like twenty million pounds yeah, just cool. to put Ted Baker on the site. That tells you this, you know, the brand isn't, in it. isn't dead. You know, sales uh, are you know well over were well over like six hundred million mm -hmm. uh, um, pounds. And obviously, the brand also has travelled. So they've got you know they've been very successful in the United States. There's evidence it's, it's travelled to Asia, Asia, Asia as well. But what they've sort of um, what they've been tripping up on is is that some really simple stuff. So, for instance, they were on a three year stock cycle. So they stuff comes out and they take two years to sell it. The whole rest of the industry moved to two years about five years ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, secondly, in terms of like um, things like labor scheduling within their stores, they don't have a huge store estate, by the way, which is actually quite quite good. Um, so there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of self help measures you can do in this. For loads. Starters. But the, so brand, but the brand, you're saying the brand isn't damaged, and therefore, we, if it's people are licensing it and, and playing royalties on the back of it, it's got a lot of kudos. It's, it can it can be a winner in the new virtual world, basically, in post immunization. Well, the e-commerce revenues during again during lockdown have gone absolutely ballistic, and they've even updated the market on that, which again would suggest that it does still resonate. Even when people are sitting at home, they want to own Ted. They want to own Ted Baker shares. 
Yeah. Um, you know, it's going to remain a very difficult, you know, environment. Um, they've got, they will, this further work they're going to have to do to move the model on between, you know, physical versus e-commerce. But the new management team and the new board, the new chairman, the former chairman of, of Next, mm. um, oh, right, fantastic okay. world business over many, over many years. So, but we do think lots of self-help they can do. And we don't have, huge, again, this is the key to some, to kind of how we're trying to, most of the, these recovery situations we're, we're in, or to, we don't try and have too heroic assumptions for kind of what level of profitability they can get back to, just a sort of normal or, you know. Give yourself of, a safety yeah. margin. Big yeah, yeah, right yeah. Down. So we're happy oh. if they do that, they should re-rate kind of still still quite a lot further from here. Um, just what was quite interesting was they did a phenomenally um, good, what helped them with the raise. They also sold their head, head office for £72 million pounds, oh, that's right. uh, for cash, which helped recapitalise without the issuance of even more shares. So some stocks which have been in this recovery, you have to be a bit careful about you know, looking at what share price it could recover to because there's been so many new shares issued. But actually, Ted's hasn't issued as many because they, um, they got that extra money in from the, from the head office. Yeah, and then the other, just just finally, we've got sort of like, uh, what, th- three, four different companies. They're all sort of like the... The infrastructure sort of reopening. I know Boris has been saying, boom, 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 we're going to build ha- lots of houses, we're going to sort of like HS2, we're going to smart motorways. And frankly, it's going to happen because we need it for the economy and job creation. And Rishi Shunak has already said that. So just give us a quick sort of like, you know, run around the houses on these Ogean, Flowtech, RPS you just bought in, which is an environmental consultant. And the final bit was Van L, which again, you've done very nicely because he you sort of started with that on 25p, and I think they're about well, 47 at the moment this morning. So uh, just yeah. quickly, I'll just finish the, the houses on those. Well, uh, what I'll try and do, we haven't planned this before, which would, if we tried a bit of a tag team between Laurie and I, and if Laurie does all G in and Vanel, and I'll do um, RPS. You sound like a wrestling pair there, yeah, yeah. a tag team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big Daddy and those John outfits. Haystacks, eh? Yeah, those. Slim down yeah, version. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind. Uh, <laughs> so if I just do RPS first, um, yeah, you, you, you recognize that, you know, that's a stock, again, that we, we never thought we'd be able to get into GHS and get a you know, reasonable size posi- position in. And it, again, it's an environmental consultant, people, people business. Um, we, we got involved in the refinance of that at 44p. Uh, it's currently 74p. We think that can at least double double from here because um, it's kind of an environmental type of consultant. Gen- generally, they're plugged into all those themes you said, urbanization, renewables, uh, infra- infrastructure spend. But what I want to and so it's capitalized now at 200 million. So, um, yeah, that's you know, right, yeah. Quite, quite, quite a lot higher than Bond Hill. But like it, it's, it's two, 200 million market. But but. Uh, um, they actually um, sales pre-COVID were about six hundred million. Mm. So um, the EV to sales ratio is very low, and we think margins are going to recover. Yeah, to point least, six. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. So we think sh- we think margins should at least recover to nine percent, but that would be a bit embarrassing for them. So we think that they should go better than that, but at least nine percent. Um, now, the, the, what's interesting about them, I know you asked to do it quickly, so I'll just do it very quickly. I think this is a classic example of um, the, uh, explain my point at the moment, which is, you know, why the US stock market should be ignored and why you should look in the UK stock market. In the US stock market, you can look up the ticker for this, it's a company called Tetra Tech, mm. okay, and Tetra Tech does broadly what RPS do. In fact, Tetra Tech acquired Kofi International, mm. which was the former job of the, the, the current CEO of RPS. So right. he sold Kofi International to Tetra Tech in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an exit. And then he came to RPS to help sort out RPS, basically. Tetra Tech is currently valued at $6.6 billion. Yeah. And basically, and, and makes about 14% margins, best, best in class. It's not very leveraged. It only has one times net, net, net debt. You know, they and they've basically been acquiring and consolidating companies. You know, that valuation, the valuation of them relative to RPS is just a classic example where you can buy exactly the same thing for a much, you know, yeah. much better, much better. And, and, and if UK investors ignore that, that arbitrage, you can guarantee a US competitor are going to bolt it on because they can get yeah. that, that uplift up straight on their stock price. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And in fact, that's the tra- that's been the trail in this sector. So investors that have followed these types of businesses for longer will remember companies like RP, uh, and so WSP, which got taken out, 
um, there's um, Scott what? Wilson got taken out. Oh, there's yeah, quite okay, a few. Yeah. Hider and all kinds of Hider. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what about so? What about Flo Tech and um, Van El and and Ogier? Laurie, do you want to do Van El? And... Yeah. So actually, Paul Van El, I'm I'm super excited about it, King, because you've got two really attractive qualities we look for in investment. There's a really strong self help initiative going on there by new chief executive Mark Cutler. New FD, Graham Campbell, and now a new chairman announced as well, Frank Nelson, who's actually just been buying quite a few shares if you if you um, follow this follow the stock. Um, and that, and the self-help strategy is all about really restructuring the business internally to recover operating operating margins back from four back to seven, which they should easily do based on peer and historic averages. Okay, so that that's element one that we really like. What's now emerged as well, which kind of creates this almost Shangri-La element we look for. We've got the recovery piece, which is the margin. But now there's quite a clear growth story that can follow on, driven by, as you mentioned earlier, you know, Boris, build, build, build. You can almost picture Boris and Rishi in the in the Treasury going, yeah, how are we gonna how are we gonna resuscitate the economy, the patient on the on the operating table? And there's you know bags of history and commentary from them on how governments turn to construction and infrastructure spending to try and jumpstart things. Okay. You know, and, and these guys are, are plugged into all sorts, you know, yeah, smart I... highways, rail construction, flood defense, they, they do all of it. And you know, they just won the first HS2 contract and we're, we're excited about this one, yeah. Yeah, and, and, um, and the other thing that I think perhaps a lot of investors haven't recognized is that they yet at the moment, you know, it hasn't been reflected in the share price, but they haven't yet reflected in, in got the benefits of the housing reopening because it, a, lot of the, a lot of the house builders have just finished off existing locations. All that breaking of new ground is now only just starting and they're, their foundation and piling business should really get jump started, you know, vertical from here. Yeah, the, the key, been... Sorry, Laura, I'll just add the key here, the key here is to really understand that how at a macro level, the, the all this infrastructure spend is going to tighten up the market. Mm. So when you're a, when you're someone like Van Ellen, who's got a set amount of kit and then basically you make more and more profit, the better the, pr- the, the projects you can pick, the better the pricing you can do, the quicker that you can get things back onto hire or into service. And essentially that's all should tighten up over the next two to three years, which means they should then go back to sort of a much better return on capital, much better margins um and and recover profitability quite 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 materially it does take time though it comes through the seasons but that's why it's a nice cycle it's not a kind of it's not going to happen overnight so you can kind of should be able to watch it come through over the years that yeah i mean that that big macro point i mean worked perfectly for uh i know we touched on it sort of like northbridge and crestchick because as you as we all know there's a world cup next year we're all hoping that there's olympic games and all Agrico, as it's a competitor's business, power supply business, is going to be out in Japan, which means that, as you rightly point out, it's going to get so demand is going to totally exceed supply. So, uh, you know, all that, you know, you're going to get a lot of activity mid next year, which is going to be just, uh, you know, price, have a very firm pricing environment, hopefully. So what about um, what about OG and and, uh, and Flowtech? Just very, very briefly. Yeah, I'll do OG and quick, then Richard can do Flowtech. I think last time when we were on Paul, we, we sort of ran you through the, the history on the gym, so I won't, I won't rehash that to keep yeah, exactly, yeah. punchy. So, so what we've actually been doing is, is looking forward to the next phase of the thesis on this one, okay? And you know, we're, we're quite excited. They have a really strong market position in the fly ash market. Um, been winning sort of, they think they were 90% of new tenders last year. And you know, we're modelling going forward to be conservative, a kind of 40% strike rate based on the fact there's three competi- two other competitors, so three in the market, and the GM have a really attractive pricing advantage there to win business. Um, going forward, that market where they do have this good position, there's a really attractive trend playing out where mm. at the moment about half the rubbish in the UK, municipal, uh, municipal rubbish, is, is um, recycled and the other half is, is, in, is put to landfill. This is, being, this is going to have to come to an end. The government are bringing it and it's not good for the environment to, to be stuffing this stuff in the ground. So there's going to be a massive increase in the incineration of non-recyclable waste. The output of that is fly ash, which is what or G, is a core part of Orgene's business is processing this fly ash. So you know, we can see how this, this division, which is about three quarters of the profits, can double over the next 10 years. So, yeah, it's enormous. It's a profit margins are great, aren't they? Yeah, there's a great earnings growth story here at, at a kind of value, value valuation. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, Paul, that I think this is a, this is a classic. If 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 listeners are trying to work out these kind of comments people make about why you should buy equities over bonds, 
I mean, Orgean is just perfect for this. Mm. I mean, at the moment, it's unbelievable. Greek, Greek two-year bonds are now negative. You pay money to lend money to the Greek government. And just so you know, their GDP, net debt to GDP is over, over 200%. So people are worried about us at 100, over 200, but we'll pay money to lend money to the Greeks. Yeah. Peru issued a bond, a 100-year bond last week at 3.23%. Yeah. Right? Orgean is going to come on to dividend list next year. We think it could easily be yielding 3.23%. Yeah. But I can tell you, like, the, the inflation protection and the fact that Orgean is probably going to be net cash by December mm -hmm. versus Peru's outlook, which is not that bad relative to some other Latin American companies, but although they have had 10 presidents in the last 14 years, so it's not all swimming in Peru, is that, you know, the, why equities can, you know, not only protect but increase your wealth in, a real, in real terms over the next few years, but bonds yeah. won't. Yeah, particularly if we get a sort of like a pickup in inflection. The other thing about OG, it's just a cash machine, isn't it? I mean, basically, the amount of cash that uh, that Jim Meredith and Mark Fry, the CEO of the FD, have generated has just been phenomenal. So who's going to do uh, Flowtech then? Which are the tag team? Go on, Laurie, you, you do Flowtech. Sure? Yeah. Okay, so um, Flowtech, distributor of, of mechanical fluid parts in the UK. Um, to summarise the thesis here, two angles, we've got re-rating and, and earnings growth. I'll do the earnings growth first and I'll tell you why it's worth what, what we think it's worth. So the earnings growth really comes from the new FD, Russell Cash, supported by a new chairman, Roger McDowell, who's known well to us, and Bryce, the CEO, driving much better gross margins, operating margins from the business with some COVID recovery. Okay? Now, the gross margins that come from really visible self-help leaders, consolidating suppliers, um, they've got too many at the moment, um, just, just legacy issues from the business. And then the operating margin improvements are going to come from better digitization of internal operating operational management and consolidation of the number of sites they currently run, the sort of distribution depots. We, we think the team there are really well equipped to, to achieve this. Bryce, the CEO, has got loads of legacy knowledge of the company. Russell, the new FD, is a really sharp operator. And Roger, one of the top the sort of non-executive in the market, you know, award-winning Ned and chairman, he actually ran a distribution business in yeah. his last executive role in the 90s. So we're keen they can deliver the earnings recovery. Now, we also think that it should be rated much higher by the stock market, and that's really driven by private equity transactions, which is something we always look for in a thesis. You know, P is a really strong... And what, you know, what type of multiples do these things go? It's trading at about six times EBITDA. But they always, they always tend to go on PE buy them on a sales basis because they tend to bolt them into much bigger distribution networks. Yeah, okay. so they, they tend to buy them on one-time sales, maybe a bit more if, if there's a bit of high quality in there. And we've been investing at Flowtech at sort of 0.6 of sales. So you've got yeah, a decent okay. rating of as well as the as well as the earnings recovery. And you know, we think it's worth nearly 200 pence a share on it when it's going completely. I think it's a it's an interesting one as well because what they've been doing is playing the arbitrage game themselves on their acquisition strategy, and you know with potential CGT changes coming up, you know we suspect there will be some smaller businesses in the new year that you know they can pounce on to sort of help people plan plan their tax um, uh, their tax uh, affairs. Um, but that's that's the case across across. I think you know the. The CGT changes could have quite a big impact on people's thinking next year. Um, and we've already seen M&A pick up and transactions pick up. Yeah. But I think that will be a feature for next year. OK, well, brilliant, guys. Well, thanks for your time. I, I just want to have one, one sort of final investment for uh, investors to have a to slider all over. I would say have a good look if you're interested in Gresham House Strategic, because I think you guys are going and this is genuine. I think you guys are going to have a banner year next year. Um, but don't answer that because that would be telling me something that I, I shouldn't know. So uh, I would say to investors, have a good, if you want to sort of play in this real deep value, put your look, have a good look at all of those stocks because there's some real... In my view, there's some real gems, and uh, you know this could be could be turned from a sort of like a you know a, a near gold mine to a to a super gold mine next year. But um, hey, I don't know. We'll wait and see. But I, you know, I'm so super excited by some of your your stock picks. So well done, guys. Well, you know, thanks very much, Paul. And you know, and I, I would you know the the key point we'd make about GHS right now is is that we think it's roughly we've got the NAV comes out later today, so we don't know. But roughly, we're on about a twelve percent discount. So you're basically getting a 12% discount to the prices on the screen. The prices on the screen are mainly value stocks, which have yeah. just basically started.
to, to move. Um, there are also small cap stocks, which look super cheap relative to large cap stocks. Mm. There are also UK stocks, which look super cheap compared to American stocks. And they're stocks, not bonds. Yeah. So basically, we think there are five key drivers for why GHS should fit into people's portfolios. And, you know, I'm sure some listeners want to buy the individual stocks as well. But if you want, you know, the active management of those and, and um, the, you know, the time, the timing that we get from our um, sort of position, positioning, then, you know, that's the way to play it, way to play it, we hope. Yeah, no, well, you've demonstrated that over the years. So uh, please see what the great work. Anyway, thanks very much, guys, for your time. Really fascinating, as always, and look forward to again chatting in the new year. And hopefully we'll have already started the immunisation programme. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. Cheers, Cheers guys.